Good morning, everyone. Good to have you guys back here with us, back from our Zeal Cafe space. Uh, so hopefully your living room, uh, to your bedroom, to your vacation home, wherever you're at these days. Uh, I know people are scattered, having fun, trying to enjoy uh, 2021. It's off to a, a start. I always feel like this. The first month of the year, you think uh, it's just going to take its time, but it flies by. Before you know it, it's the end of January, uh, and today is that. It's the last day of January. Uh, so for us, as we dive into this, you know, we've been, we've been going through <clears throat> Matthew 5, 6, and 7. You know, we, we really felt like moving into this year, God was saying to us at Zeal that this is the year of the disciple. <clears throat> it's a year to really focus and double down on discipleship. You know, for, for us as a body of Christ, we are, we're called to make disciples. This is what Jesus asked us to do as the body of Christ. And in Matthew 28, go into all the world and preach the gospel and make disciples of all nations. If we're not doing that, what are we doing? <clears throat> if we're not doing that and not doing that well, then what are we doing? We need to reassess. We need to rethink. We need to regroup a little bit. And we really felt like this year, God was calling us at Zeal in particular to double down on discipleship, to make disciples like we've never done it before, to set processes in place, to set groups in place, to set people on a trajectory where they are being mentored and making, making men, uh, and mentoring others, making disciples and being disciples themselves. And I think for us, it's this constant uh, submission, even with two Christ but also to each other, that there's so much I can learn from all the people around me. Man, there's people around me who are know more about the, the Holy Spirit and how, to, how, to, how he operates in our lives. There's more people around me that, that know more about the Bible, know more about the Word than I do. And there's so many people who just have life experiences, just more experiences in, in what it looks like to have a godly marriage or to raise godly kids. And there's so many things we can learn from even just one another. So it's this constant submission uh, to God, our Father, and then even to those he's placed in our lives. And, you know, as we work through Matthew 5, 6, and 7, I feel like every single time I'm probably going to start uh, by saying and repeating where we're going and what the purpose is. And the main portion of scripture in Matthew 5 is Matthew 5, 48. In Matthew 5, 48, it says, be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly father is perfect. Be perfect. This is what we're driving towards. And some of us would say, well, perfection is, is, is that's not even attainable. Well, I, I would always challenge that by saying, God has never asked us to do something in which he doesn't also give us the grace to walk it out. That would be cruel as a father for me to say to my son or my daughter, do this, set something up, right? It's like, hey, you need, you need to go ride your bike across town. And, it's, and my two-year-old's like, I don't even know how to ride a bike. And you, you never taught me. And it's like, well, good luck, buddy. That's not, that's just cruel. Like you wouldn't do that. And so our Heavenly Father not only calls us to this, to be perfect, but also gives us the grace and also imparts to us his spirit to walk out what he's called us to. Uh, and I always love that. And driving forward in, in Matthew 7, 24 through 27, it says this, Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain fell, the rivers rose, and the, windows, the winds blew and pounded that house, yet it didn't collapse because its foundation was on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and doesn't act on them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain fell, the rivers rose, the winds blew and pounded that house, yet it collapsed and its collapse was great. And for all of us, we want to be the wise men who not only hear the word of God, who not only hear what God's saying, but act upon it. And that is how our life is solid, firmly rooted, firmly established on the rock of Jesus Christ. We don't want to be those people who just say, you know, I go to church, you know, I attend, I go in every Sunday, but when I leave, I do nothing differently. I don't actually take the word and apply it to my life. And that's what we're driving towards. And I love how Jesus just makes that so plain and so simple for us. You know, we've been diving into the beginning of Matthew 5. This is where we're at. We feel like we're going to be in Matthew 5, 6, and 7 for a long period of time. So buckle in, uh, get ready, enjoy the ride. Uh, and in Matthew 3, Matthew 5, 3, it says, Blessed are the poor in spirit because the kingdom of heaven is theirs. And last week, we dove into this, the poor in spirit, the poor in spirit, the, the, the humble in spirit, those who are constantly saying and recognizing their awareness of their need for God. 
Jesus, I need you. Holy Spirit, I need you. Father God, I need you. This is my prayer. It's a constant awareness of my, uh, of my lack, lack in every single area and my full awareness of my constant need for Jesus as my provider, as my healer, uh, as, as the one who's going to just watch over my life and, and provide for me and take care of me and, and show me where to go and, and give me vision and direction for my life and for my family. Uh, I have a constant dependence upon him. Also, right? from a place of salvation, I have a constant awareness of my need for Jesus in that space. What we're going to dive into today is, is verse 4. Matthew, Matthew 5, verse 4 says, Blessed are those who mourn because they will be comforted. Blessed are those who mourn for they will be comforted. So Father, we thank you for this time here today. We thank you for who you are, that you're a good father, that you're watching over us. I thank you. God, we want to be perfect as our Heavenly Father is perfect. We want to fulfill and walk out what you've called us to. We want to be the people who hear and act. So I ask God today as we work through this that we would be ones that get a hold of what you're saying, get a hold of what you're doing, and live it out. Hear and act. So Father, we just submit this to you and submit our time to you. We just ask for revelation and wisdom to be here with us. In Jesus' name, amen. As we dive into this in Matthew 4, it says, Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. In, in verse 3, we talked about this last week, that the blessed are the poor in spirit because the kingdom of heaven is theirs. Meaning, the poor in spirit have access to something, the kingdom of heaven, that other people do not have access to. Jesus started this whole, uh, this whole message, the Sermon on the Mount, with poor in spirit. He's talking about the humble, the, 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 the ones who go low, who are saying, I recognize my constant need for God. I'm not high and prideful. I'm low and humble. <clears throat> and I stay there. And it leads to the, the kingdom of heaven being theirs, in their possession, here and for the age to come. Now, blessed are those who mourn because they will be comforted. Blessed are those who mourn. So now it's blessed are those who mourn because the mourning, those who actually walk in this, now have access to comfort <clears throat> because they will be comforted. Blessed are those who, who mourn because they will be comforted. And this is talking about a spiritual mourning. A spiritual mourning, not, not natural mourning, which leads to death, right? We, we all have natural mourning. Even the world has natural mourning, right? When someone passes away, uh, when you lose a loved one, when someone, uh, when you send a kid off to college, there's like a natural mourning process, um, in our daily lives. We, we have this and we know what that is. But this is talking about a spiritual mourning, a spiritual mourning. And it's mainly wrapped around your awareness of the stain that sin has left upon your soul. You realize that your sin has actually kept you from God and you, have, you are now aware of it. It's, it's, an, it's, a, it's an awareness where I, I'm now mourning for, for <laughs> because of my sin. There's literal grief that is manifested in, in, in your body, in yourself. I am aware. You know, it kind of looks like this. You know, before I knew Jesus, I didn't mourn over my sin. Now that I know Jesus, I mourn over my sin. I mourn over that which keeps me from him. Because being in relationship with Jesus is my most precious thing in the entire world. My relationship with him. I want to be close to him, but I realize my sin has kept him far away. But the world, if you don't know Jesus and you don't have an awareness of this, then you don't mourn over your sin. So now catch this. If you mourn over your sin and what's going on there, <clears throat> uh, there's actually two parts to this. So I'll get into the first one now. You mourn over your sin and then what's the comfort piece? The comfort comes when the comforter comes, the Holy Spirit, right? So this might be if you didn't know Jesus, right? And then you had an awareness of your sin, which leads to mourning. And then the comfort is, now the Holy Spirit comes and I am assured of my salvation and forgiveness of sin and peace with God. So I was mourning over my sin, but now I've received forgiveness of sin and peace with God. I've received salvation because I've received Jesus Christ as my personal Lord and Savior. 
the Holy Spirit worked in my life, revealed to me what was going on, revealed to me my issues, everything that was taking place. And now I have an awareness of my sin and what it was doing in my life. And now I'm submitted to Jesus Christ as my personal Lord and Savior. And I have peace and forgiveness of sin. That's one way. Another way is there's mourning over a need for breakthrough in your life. So I'll give you a real practical example. In my personal life, there was a period of time where I did not serve Jesus when I was younger. I, I, w- I would say I was not saved. I didn't know Jesus. Uh, I had no awareness of, of my sin uh, and what it was actually doing. But my parents <clears throat> mourned over my soul, mourned over my life. They needed breakthrough. They absolutely needed breakthrough. So they mourned and they cried for years. There were years of this that was actually taking place, that was actually happening. Now, my parents are mourning over my sin, over my life, because I'm their son. They're mourning. They want me to know Jesus as my personal Lord and Savior. They want me to know him as a personal Lord and Savior. So that's one part of this, right? So you have this going on. You have this taking place. Then they experienced breakthrough. And the, experience, the breakthrough came when I actually had an awareness and a, a revealing in my own heart and in my own mind of who Jesus was and that my sin kept me from him. That was actually taking place. So their mourning over my soul and then I began to mourn over my soul <laughs> because I needed to, because I, ne- I actually needed to mourn over my sin. But then the comfort came in the breakthrough where I had an awareness that led to my salvation. That God, in his kindness, revealed to me what my sin was actually doing to me in my soul and in my life. And it led to salvation, which was the comforting, the peace of God that actually came upon my life. Where I realized my sins were forgiven uh, and I have peace with God. So my parents no longer mourned because they were comforted. I no longer mourned in this space of saying my soul needs to be saved. I'm missing out on this whole thing that God has came and he's comforted me. Now there can be an ongoing mourning, but you can see in the difference between blessed are the poor in spirit. The poor in spirit, literally this person who continually stays low and humble before God. The mourning though, blessed are those who mourn, that can come and go. That can come and go as you have an awareness of God because it's these two sides. I mourn, but then I'm comforted. I mourn, but then I'm comforted. I mourn, but then I'm comforted. So you see this in my life. There was a time I mourned over my sin and and my salvation because I didn't have that. And then I was comforted with the Holy Spirit of God in this space. There's, There's that thing that actually takes place. But it doesn't mean I never mourn because then what happens as I move forward, I'm at peace with God. I have forgiveness of my sin. But what happens if I sin again? I mourn again. I grieve again because I realize that what my sin has done is actually separated me from God. And I immediately humble myself and go back into this place and receive the comfort of God once again. Mourning and comforting. Mourning and comforting. Mourning and comforting. It's it's the ebb and flow of this. The blessed are those who mourn because they will be comforted. Now, let me show you this. In 1 Corinthians, um, it's really amazing that we actually have a whole... uh, piece in scripture that kind of shows us what this actually looks like in a real practical church. So if you turn with me to 1 Corinthians 5, 1 Corinthians 5, this is what takes place. It says, it's widely reported that there is sexual immorality among you in the kind of sexual immorality that is not even condoned among the Gentiles. A man is living with his father's wife and you are inflated with pride instead of filled with grief so that he who has committed this act might be removed from among you. For though absent in body but present in spirit, I have already decided about him who has done this thing as though I were present. In the name of our Lord Jesus, when you are assembled along with my spirit and with the power of our Lord Jesus, turn that one over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. Your boasting is not good. Don't you know that a little yeast permeates the whole batch of dough? Clean out the old yeast so that you may be a new batch since you are unleavened. So understand this. There's wicked sin taking place within this body of believers in the Corinthian church. And Paul is identifying it and saying, hey, this thing that you're allowing, that you're walking in spiritual pride towards, this is not okay. This is not okay. But now... In 2 Corinthians 8, if you turn over to 2 Corinthians 8, you see this piece now. 
Now, 1 Corinthians, obviously Paul's first letter to the Corinthian church. And then you have the 2 Corinthians, which is Paul's second letter to the Corinthian church. Now he says this in response, and you have to keep this in mind, wicked sin, wicked uh, sexual immorality taking place within the church to a degree that he's even saying that doesn't even happen with people who don't know Jesus. Yet you're allowing it and saying that's okay in our church and that's fine. Now catch this. 2 Corinthians 7, starting in verse 5, I'll begin to read as you guys get there. So 2 Corinthians 7, starting in verse 5, it says, In fact, we came into Macedonia, we had no rest. Instead, we were afflicted in every way, struggles on the outside, fears inside. But God, who, com- com- who comforts the humble, comforted us by coming by the coming of Titus, and not only by his coming, but also by the comfort he received from you. He announced to us your deep longing, your sorrow, your zeal for me, so that I rejoiced even more. For although I grieved you with my letter, I do not regret it. Even though I did regret it, since I saw that the letter grieved you, though only for a little while. Now I'm rejoicing, not because you were grieved, but because your grief led to repentance. For you were grieved as God willed, so that you didn't experience any loss from us. For godly grief produces, now catch this, a repentance not to be regretted and leading to salvation, but worldly grief produces death. For consider how much diligence this very thing is, gr- this grieving as God wills has produced in you. What a desire to clear yourselves, what indignation, what fear, what deep longing, what zeal, what justice. In every way, you have commended yourselves to be pure in this matter. Now, I love this because this is a real, practical, tangible thing for us to get, our, get, our, uh, get a hold of right now as we kind of read through and look like what does mourning or what does this grief look like in the natural, look like uh, in a real church context. You have the Corinthian church who's struggling by allowing and being indifferent to, prideful towards sexual immorality that's actually taking place within the body of believers. Now, catch this. Paul's not saying that out towards the world. He's like, no, 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 that's the kind of stuff you should expect from the world. So he's, like, he's saying, don't put the world uh, on the side and say, no, 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 don't come, in, don't come through these doors. He's saying that if a brother is doing this, if a brother in, who calls himself a brother in Christ or a sister in Christ is acting in this way, this is supposed to be your response. You're actually supposed to call them out. And say what you're doing is wrong. This is not okay, and it's not okay here. And Paul's saying that by doing this, you're handing them over for their benefit that the flesh would die and their spirit would come alive. Because what's more important, the flesh or the spirit? It's obviously the spirit. And we want you to be walking wholeheartedly before your God. Not in sexual immorality, not in ways of the world that would only glorify the, glorify the flesh and glorify the enemy. We don't want that. We want the ones who are actually going to be wholeheartedly in love with Jesus, giving their whole selves over to him. That's what we really want. And he's actually saying this. He said, I I was sorry to hear that when you first received my letter, 1 Corinthians, that you were grieved. That you were grieved by it. But he said, no, 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 but not any longer. Now I'm almost excited because your grief led to repent re, led to repentance which repentance leads to salvation and that's what we want in our whole lives that grief leads to repentance and repentance leads to salvation so <clears throat> it literally leads goes from this one place of uh, I'm grieving a mourning to this place of repentance <clears throat> which is the just this wholeheartedness not a dull spirit a vibrant spirit before God and leading to salvation which is this is what we want for our lives a wholehearted lifestyle of devotion to Jesus no compromise and catch this it literally says that this mourning produced or this grief produced six things it actually says these six things that were produced in these people because they allowed the grief to actually take hold of them. Now, I want you to see this on the other side. If Paul called them out, if Paul called these church, this church out, these church leaders out, and they said, wow, Paul did this, Paul called out and said, that's wrong. They, they really had three options. 
spiritual pride, which he says they're walking in, spiritual pride, is actually this place of just being indifferent and saying, no, 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 we got this figured out. We don't need your help. I'm not willing to hear from you. I'm not willing to, to allow you to teach us. And they're, they're being prideful towards what they believe. <clears throat> the other side is spiritual passivity. Meaning, Paul could have written this letter and said, hey, what's happening in your church is wrong. And they could have been like, oh, oh, that's, that's too bad. And not necessarily walking in pride, but just being passive, like, oh, yeah, I don't, I don't know. Like, oh, it's not that we disagree with you. It's just that, uh, I don't know, that might be hard. It might be difficult. It sounds like a hard conversation to have with somebody. Uh, so we're just going to be a little passive about it. But spiritual humility, spiritual humility is a willingness to receive from Paul what he wrote to them in 1 Corinthians and say, we need to change, we need to shift. <clears throat> and because we need to shift, we're willing to grieve over what we've allowed. We're willing to greed over what we've allowed to take place. <clears throat> and the mourning produced six things. Number one, a desire to clear yourselves. A desire to walk in purity. Meaning, <clears throat> Paul says, the way you've led this, the way you've walked through this is improper and it's not right. It's actually immoral. So, they, the grief that they began to walk in now produced a desire in them to clear themselves, to rid themselves of all impurity. And they begin to walk in this. Second, indignation. It says, what indignation? But indignation against compromise. Meaning before this, they were indifferent. They were walking in spiritual pride. But now there's an indig indignation towards compromise. I mean, it's saying we're no longer going to compromise in these matters. We're going to be firm and we're going to stand on the word of God. And we're going to stand on the laws of purity. What God has set out for us. That's what we want. Thirdly, it produced a fear of the Lord in them. It says, what fear? What fear? Yeah, what fear? The fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord was produced in them and saying, this is what we're going after. We're going to walk in the ways of God more than anything else. We're going to fear the Lord more than we fear man. More than this difficult conversation, which I can imagine as a leader in that church, having to go up to this man and that whole situation and say, this is horrendous what's taking place. That must have been a difficult conversation, but they began to fear the Lord more than they feared man. It's amazing. Now fourth, a deep longing for Jesus. A deep longing for who Jesus is, for who he's called them to be. A deep longing, even says that to be with Paul once again, to have him come close. There's this deep longing for fellowship. A deep longing. Now fifth, zeal. <clears throat> which I love how many times in the Bible it says the zeal of the Lord will accomplish, accomplish this. It's actually like an action oriented. It's a duty oriented. Zeal for the law of purity. Meaning we will walk this out. We will live this out. We will move forward in this. The zeal of the Lord will accomplish this. Zeal for the law of purity. Zeal for sanctification within our community. We want this fully and wholeheartedly. And lastly, uh, justice. Justice. Actual vengeance in their sentence against the offender. Meaning, they actually walked this out and took care of this. Like, their zeal and their justice. They actually said, you know what, Paul? You're right. We're, grieving, we're grieved over this matter, and we're going to take care of it. And they did. And who reported it? <clears throat> it says they sent Titus. They sent Titus. And Titus went. <clears throat> and reported it to Paul and said, this is what they've done. This is what they did with the letter you sent them. It produced fruit. Mourning, spiritual mourning. Blessed are those who mourn because they will be comforted. The grief that they experienced over the letter that Paul wrote, that he called them out practically and said, this is wrong, what you're allowing in your, in your body. You should do something about it. They did, and it produced in them fruit. And they were comforted. Paul was comforted. And they were comforted as well as they, as they get this letter back from Paul and says, essentially, great job. Great job. You honored the Lord and you honored me. That's amazing. 
And I want us to just to encourage us as we continue to move through this that blessed are those who mourn because they will be comforted. Blessed are those who mourn because they will be comforted. You know, uh, I always think back when I think of like mourning, I think back to the 1800s and there was a man in upstate New York called Charles Finney and Charles Finney was a revivalist of that day <clears throat> and he started something called the, the mourner's bench and this was a, liter- a literal bench, a wood bench that would be placed either right up front or towards the middle of the room and this was where people who were grieved over the condition of their soul grieved over their sin would go and sit and would travail and weep as others would pray for them and specifically praying for their salvation that's what they're driving for that's what they're going after and i think that's so interesting that there was a literal moment a literal time to weep and to mourn and i would wonder do you mourn over the condition of your soul you might be listening to this and say i don't even know jesus well you uh, you would wonder say god do i can, do i even weep do i even mourn over my sin because if you don't it's actually a gift from god that you would mourn over the condition of your soul that you would mourn over the stain sin has left upon your soul and upon your life that you would mourn. Blessed are those who mourn because they will be comforted. I think we need to mourn. I think there's times in our lives where we need God to break through and we actually need to get on our knees and we need to cry out and we need breakthrough. We need breakthrough. I know many of us are saying, uh, actually, I would say all of us at this point, you just realize so many times after we just walked through a year that we walked through, our country needs Jesus in a big way. Regardless of who won an election, our country needs Jesus in a big way. If, if Trump won, we, we still would have been in this incredible divide. Biden won, and now we're still in this incredible divide. We need Jesus. We need Jesus in a, a, a tremendous way to sweep over our land and to bring revival. We, we, we want this. Do you cry out for this? Do you cry out for the salvation of your neighbors? Do you cry out for the salvation of your loved ones? Do you cry out for the salvation of your city? Do you cry out for the salvation of our nation? I believe mourning is a gift from God. And I love that blessed are those who mourn because they will be comforted. You will be comforted when you shed tears of mourning in relation to what God has, whether your sin or you need breakthrough, you need God to come through in a big way and you move into that space of saying, God, I can't do it. You, you're the only one that can do it. And I'm grieved to this place and I won't be comforted by anyone else but you. I believe he's so honored by that. So let me pray for you today. Father, I thank you that as we dive into these Beatitudes, I thank you that blessed are those who mourn because they will be comforted. God, I thank you that there are many, even on this call right now, that have been mourning. They've been mourning a loved one. They've been mourning uh, the salvation of their soul. It could be a sickness, disease that they need someone to be healed of. Uh, God, it could be breakthrough in their lives financially, breakthrough in a marriage, breakthrough in so many different ways. But Father, I thank you that every tear that has been shed, every place of mourning, in grief over sin. God, I thank you that the comforter is here. The comforter is coming. Your word promises promises us, blessed are those who mourn because they will be comforted. They will be, not, not, not uh, someday or every couple people, they will be comforted. So I just release comfort to those who have been mourning right now in Jesus' name, that you would comfort their souls. And God, I just pray that even as this type of message, I pray that each one of us would be able to check our heart and check our spirit. Say, God, when's the last time I actually mourned for breakthrough? I actually mourned over the condition of my soul. When was the last time So, Father, I just thank you for our time here together. I just bless everyone. I pray that we not only hear, but we act. In Jesus' name, everyone said, amen, amen, amen. We'll see you guys next week.